Welcome to today's Coworking and Circuits. I'm super excited about our speaker today, Yov Zinger. Uh, he's going to speak about designing hardware for automated assembly. Um, and today I'm going to go over agenda, just really high level. Um, and this is like, I'd say it's pretty informal. So feel, feel free to like, um, if you have a question, you can post it in the chat and uh, we'll try and get to it at the end of the talk. So brief intro, this is an event that we, we hold um, every two weeks and it's a great way to meet other people in hardware, hear about what they're building, share learnings and whatnot. Um, and it's also an opportunity to try out Flux, uh, which is a collaborative hardware design tool and hear about the new stuff that we're shipping and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, so yeah, that's the intro. <laughs> we'll hear a presentation. I'm not sure how long it was going to be. Um, you know, I just said 30 minutes, but feel free to go a little bit over if you're, you're not super, um, you know, dialed in on time. It's all good. We can be flexible and then we'll have some questions, um, afterwards. So does that sound good? All right, I'll, I'll uh, introduce Yov real quick. So Yov is a serial entrepreneur, technologist, financer, and angel investor across multiple industries, in particular green energy. Uh, he founded Kiwi Power in his living room and grew it to be one, become one of the UK's leading smart grid energy company, which sold in 2018 to NG, one of the largest utilities in the world. Wow. Um, Prior to this, Yo founded a mobile gains company, was co-founded a private equity fund, <clears throat> and developed an ultra deep water oil rig worth 1.5 billion. That sounds crazy. I want to hear more about that. Um, yeah, and now he's working on Launchpad, and I'll I'll let him tell you about that. Welcome. Awesome, great. Thank you so much. Thank you for the lovely introduction. I, it's almost like I could have written it myself. Um, <laughs> you I, did. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's really nice to be talking to everybody. And in, in, in particular, I have to tell you, I've really missed talking to groups of people. You know, COVID doesn't make it easy. Um, and so thanks so much for the invitation, Lance. And, and thanks everyone for joining, especially um, uh, uh, some people, uh, you know, it's the middle of the night. Um, I'll, I'll try my best to, 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 to be interesting enough to keep you awake for that 30 minute period. Um, so <clears throat> I, I figured the, the, the best way to talk about this is just to run through um, a short presentation I put together. So I'm hoping it's okay if I share my screen. Yes, you should have permission. And then hopefully everyone can see this. I'm on a huge monitor over here, so it may be a bit small, but, but tell me that it's all okay. Looks great, looks great. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll, I'll talk primarily about the topic uh, at hand over here, which is uh, designing hardware for automated assembly. This is very interesting to, to us at Launchpad because this is at the heart of what we do. But I don't want to make this an ad for Launchpad. I'll tell you a bit about what we're doing at the end, um, but really this is the topic. And I guess the, the, the first part of this is why do we actually care about this? Um, most people don't because most people just buy products. Even people that design products don't necessarily think about how the assembly is going to happen, let alone uh, designing it so that it's suitable for automated assembly for a bunch of different reasons. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and primarily um, because there's a today either a very big divide between design and manufacturing assembly, or they're so tightly coupled together that you don't necessarily, you're so far into the weeds, you don't necessarily think about what else could, could be done. But we care about it, and, and we really care about it, I, I'd say, for four big reasons. So the first one is speed. If you can automate something, then you can bring it to market much, much faster. Um, you can also keep up with technology trends because you can redesign and then automate the assembly of it again. Um, when things are manual, there's a, a lag time involved with all of this stuff. So I'd say speed is, is, is a super important uh, uh, first thing. But the second one is actually quality as well. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the ability to automate means that you know upfront exactly what's going to happen. Um, and it means that you can repeat the same process again and again and again. And what that means is that you don't end up with the kind of errors that you have when things are done manually. 
either because people did a task wrong or because people use an old version of a file or because people looked at, a, at, a, at, at an incomplete set of documentation or whatever. Um, <clears throat> quality also lends itself to, to inspection and testing. When you can automate the manufacture of something, you must know enough about the product to also be able to inspect and test it in ways that if people do in a, in a non-systematic way, they may miss things. And so even if everything else works, your, your, your quality fails at the, at the final step. So that's the second thing. <clears throat> the third thing that, that we really care about at Launchpad is the fact that if you can automate assembly, then you can remove a lot of the labor um, that's involved, which means you can start assembling products in higher cost countries. And, and that means you can build more products locally. Um, th this is really important for us because we think that the ability to build more products locally is going to be good for innovation. Um, you can turn things around much faster. You can have multiple iterations of the same product. Um, being closer to, to, to the source of making your product means you can be more tightly involved with the design. Um, we think that's good for economic growth for a country. We think that in the long run, moving towards a much more automated way of products means that we can even have different business models um, <clears throat> where you don't have to design a product for a long time, manufacture it for a long time and sell it for a long time. You can have a much more dynamic uh, uh, environment, a little bit like fashion uh, um, was revolutionized by the fast fashion movement. The final thing is, and, and I care about this particularly, is because we, we think that automation leads to green. Because if you can make things locally, you need to spend a lot less carbon transporting them around the world. If you can make things locally and to demand, you don't throw away as much. And, and we think that's going to be, or we, some of us think it's important today, we think that's going to grow in importance in, in, in the future as well. So that's why we care about it. And to, to get a little bit more specific, when I say automation, what I'm actually talking about, the, 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 the sort of the ideal is autonomous. And what that means is automation that doesn't need to be programmed. One of the big barriers to automation today. You can buy machines that do a lot of stuff. Uh, you can buy robot arms that move things around. You can buy uh, uh, robot screwdrivers that, that, that put things together. You can buy glue dispensers. The, the challenge is that most of these uh, uh, platforms need to be programmed quite explicitly. And that takes time and it costs money. And it's inflexible because if you want to change something, you either need to change your entire hardware platform, so the tools that do all the work, um, or and or you need to also reprogram them, which again can take time. Um, <clears throat> we think that autonomous means that you don't need to program it. It's defined by the designs. So rather than engineering your automation to build your product, it's design. It 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 comes to being because of the design of the product. You spend your time designing the product, and the automation takes care of itself. We think it particularly lends itself to products that need to be flexible, um, or and or products that are high in mix. Um, in other words, you're not necessarily making the same product again and again and again, but you're customizing them in some way, you're responding to market trends. Um, we also think that if you're able to automate um, in software, um, the, uh, automation comes from software. Software can give feedback. And what that means is you, you eliminate the delay between designing something and receiving feedback from the person that's going to be manufacturing for you, which today can be weeks or even, even a month. And, and I, I'm, maybe you guys have some stories, we, we certainly do. If you can cut that time down to zero, in other words, have software give you the feedback, um, we think that can dramatically change the way that you design things. So that's why we care about it. That, that's what we mean when we say automation. Um, very quickly, what are we doing in this space? Um, <clears throat> and I'll talk about this a little bit more later if, if, if you guys want, but it's our solution is basically two components to it. The first one is software. The second one is hardware, and they're tied together um, yeah, with simulation and AI that we developed. But in a nutshell, what you see on the on the left over here is our app, where <clears throat> you, as a designer, upload your complete product CAD, so your entire product that you designed. Our software immediately classifies every component, figures out how they need to get made or bought or assembled, um, and, and gives you all that feedback, and figures out the sequence that the product will be assembled in does all of it for you and just shows you a final output and a final price and delivery date for whatever volume you want. The second part of that is we've designed, and if you want, I can talk about it in depth, but otherwise I'll leave it at this. We've designed and built an automated assembly machine. You can see in graphics over here. Um, and, and if you guys want, I can show you videos of, of the thing working in the real world. <clears throat> Effectively, the machine takes all of the components, they get loaded up into, into work trays, and the machine goes ahead and assembles the product from its components. 
The, the key is the machine doesn't need to be programmed. It doesn't need to be told what to do. It learns everything from the web app and simulation. We have a machine vision system. There's cameras all over this thing um, that then transfers what it learns in the simulation into the real world. So that's what I'm talking about by automation and autonomous. So when, when we think about designing for automated assembly, there's two big things that I want to sort of keep in mind. The first one is I'm talking about a whole product. So I'm not talking about an individual part. I'm not talking about 3D printing something out of plastic. I'm talking about a real product made out of multiple components. Um, we, we, we say hardware, we say product, we use the, the sort of the phrase interchangeably, but in particular, our sweet spot is mechanical and electric. So <clears throat> a, a number of components made of different materials together with PCBs, buttons, switches, ports, and so on. Um, we're, we're, we're also talking about an entire product where some things you can buy off the shelf and some things you need to make yourself. Um, so for example, you may use standardized screws, you may use a standard motor, you're probably going to be making your own plastic components for the housing or the enclosure. Um, you may uh, machine specific components, you may injection mold specific components, you may be assembling PCBAs and, and you may be making your own cables. So we're talking about all of the above into a full product. The, the second thing to keep in mind is that this <clears throat> you know, relatively short uh, uh, talk by somebody that is no expert in everything to do with manufacturing. I have to talk to my CTO offer about that. Um, this is really just one component in the entire world of BFX. And X can be any of these, right? You can design for cost, you can design for reliability and so on. So <clears throat> these things are not mutually exclusive. Some of them support each other and some of them are trade-offs. And, and we're talking specifically about automated assembly, but it has to be considered in the context of the other areas of design. So with all of that, really, I, I wanna focus on six big areas. Um, none of these are rocket science. Um, all of these are, uh, can be classed as best practices. Um, all of them together make automated assembly much, much easier, much more feasible. Um, th this isn't really a complete list. Um, th there's probably another I'd say 10 categories behind this that we could talk about, but these I'd say are the six big ones. And I'm not gonna give you a lecture on every one, I'm just gonna sort of break these out. And, and the, the first one, which to us is the most important is to do everything in CAD. And, and maybe to some of you, this is, you know, it's like saying when you drink water, you should do it out of a, out of a cup. And, and it's quite simple. I'm saying that because I've got a cup of water in front of me and I'm struggling with an analogy, but the, the, this isn't necessarily the, the, the most trivial thing in the world. The, the design process can start in pieces of paper, it can start in post-it notes, it, it can start in email, um, it can start in, uh, in, in Photoshop. So <clears throat> that's fine for people, right? People can take a whole bunch of different data and put it together and figure out what to do. Um, but, a, but a machine really can't, at least not yet today. A our process and our journey has to start with something that a computer can understand in a, in a almost completely unambiguous way. And, and that means can. Um, and so a couple of things to consider. One is use a major format that you, know, you can share with people. Don't use something so bespoke that only you will be able to use it. And, and model everything relevant. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily model absolutely everything, but it does mean don't have components that, that, that should exist in your final assembly that don't exist in the CAD. Um, we, we see that happen sometimes with cables and fasteners and snaps and that kind of stuff. Um, but also don't necessarily go into the, the, the total detail of modeling out pins and chips if it's not really relevant. Um, it can make the cat quite heavy to work with and, and, and not really necessary. But you want to make sure at the very least that every component that actually is going to get into an assembly in a bomb is modeled in the cat. Um, you, you also want to try as much as possible to include metadata in the cat file. Um, the more metadata you provide in the cat file and not in you know a PDF or an email or something like that, the, the, <clears throat> the, the more a system can then do something with. At the very least, try to include colors and finishes. Um, if you have specific uh, components you want sourced from vendors, include the vendors and include the part numbers from those vendors. Um, th th there's a bunch of other metadata that is useful. Um, there's probably never too much, um, and, and it's worth including as much as possible. Um, and and, and the, the, the last point is treat the CAD file as if it's a, it's a, it's a real descriptor that, that has no ambiguity. And, and, and that means you shouldn't do things in a CAD file that are in part. I hope you guys can't hear my dog screaming at the squirrel, I apologize. Um, <clears throat> the, try, try to avoid things that can't really exist in the real world. And, and what that means is things like objects colliding within each other, um, objects interfering with each other, um, impossible geometries that can never actually be made in the real world, um, uh, um, parts that float in midair, um, parts that don't have sufficient stability to support them, and, and so on. And 
if you can get your CAD file to a point where it can actually uh, be a real representation of the object that's, of the products can be made, it makes life much easier down the line, avoids a whole bunch of back and forth. Uh, the, the, the next part, <clears throat> probably the easiest way to describe it is, is to keep it simple. And th there's a few things that, that make uh, a simplicity uh, uh, of assembly um, sort of flow from the rest of it. So the first one is try as much as possible to think about the parts that you're making um, and, and try to minimize them by combining three parts or two parts into one part. And there's different kinds of uh, manufacturing methodologies that can make that happen. Um, but the fewer number of parts that need to be manipulated, the, the, the easier. Um, the, the, the second point is, is more of a cost issue, but it also sort of comes to assembly as well. If you minimize the types of parts, the types of manufacturing process, the types of finishes, um, it makes everything much easier to work with, and it also makes everything much cheaper. Of course, you have to balance that out against the product you're making. Um, but sometimes products are designed almost by committee, and, and people don't necessarily take a step back and think about how do I minimize the, the number of things that I'm doing. Um, I'll come back to orientations a bit later, but <clears throat> an, an important thing to think about is to, is to minimize the number of different orientations that, that need to happen for the product you're building. Um, you don't want to do too few that the product doesn't actually make sense, but the fewer orientations that you can make, and, and what I mean by that is number of times the, the entire subassembly needs to be picked up and repositioned, the fewer you can do, the easier it is to actually manufacture the end. And in particular, a vertical bottom-up stack is the easiest because gravity assists with everything. And, and so if you think about uh, the stupidest example in the world, I can design my smartphone like this, or I can design it like this. If I design it like this and I put first the housing and then the PCB and, 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 and then the battery and then the screen and so on, it's much easier than if I design it like this because gravity helps me pull these together. It's just a design thing, the same product, really, really simple. <clears throat> the, the, the next thing um, that we ask people to consider is to standardize. And again, it's not rocket science, but if you pick components which are specific and you, you have a vendor in mind for a particular kind of screw or a particular kind of motor or connector or whatever it is, um, then it's easier to obtain, it's easier to get from the supply chain. Um, and if you pick a digital vendor, you can also get the CAD files for the components and so your CAD model is more accurate. Um, you can go to McMaster car, you can go to GDP, you can go to lots and lots of places and get the CAD files of the components you want and, and put them straight into your CAD file instead of using a generic library. Um, the, the second part, again, it's more of a cost thing, but it also affects assembly as well. If you can use the same components in multiple places um, in, in, in the assembly, it lowers your cost. It also makes it easy to assemble because you have fewer tool changes than needed. So if you can use the same screw across the entire product, great. If you can use one big screw and one small screw rather than three different kinds of small screws. Great. So thinking about that, again, not rocket science, ma ma makes a big difference down the line. <clears throat> the, the next one is to actually think about the tools um, that are going to gonna be used to, to assemble your product. And, and <clears throat> the, the first one is to remember that someone or something has to actually put the product together, right? Something needs to happen. And, 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 and that is something that happens in the real world. And so thinking about how would I pick this up? How would a robot pick this up? Do I have enough space to get the tool in? Um, is this a geometry that can actually be manipulated? And so on and so on. <clears throat> Things like uh, um, tabs and, and slots and that kind of stuff, um, they, they help because they help things self-align. And so with a, with, a, with a slot, you know that if you move two components together, they'll just fit together versus micro and accurate uh, uh, um, uh, positioning without those kind of features. Um, the, the tool clearances is something that's really important. The, the, <clears throat> the way that your product will actually be assembled is different components will be picked up, they'll be put together, um, screws will be inserted, glue will be dispensed, and so on. And you want to make sure that during an assembly, you have enough space to get the tool in, do its task, and get the tool out again during the assembly. Um, one of the benefits of working with, with our software that we developed is it does all of this for you. So all of the tool clearances, everything is done in simulation, uh, in real time, and you'll actually get feedback that there is not enough clearance for a tool to be inserted, and, and you'll get that before you go do, too far down the line to know where to, where to adjust your, your, your design. But it's something that you can think about as well. Um, I think we had a, yo, know, real quick, uh, yeah. just because it's relevant, Theodore asked, how do you handle retooling? Uh, Theodore, go, go ahead and explain your yeah. question. 
Sorry, it was just in, re in reference to, I think you were talking about Launchpad and just showing the assembly by the robots. Mm -hmm. And one thing is when you need to be retooling those robotic arms, mm -hmm. how do you how do you think about retooling in terms of, uh, you know, the autonomous uh, full assembly there? When you say retooling, you mean swapping out tools? Yeah. <clears throat> so it's a great question. So the first thing that, that the system does is it picks a tool and it does it by trying its entire library of tools for a task. It, it's not stupid. We program some rules so it doesn't try to, you know, pick up a component using a screwdriver, but it will try every kind of tool that it has to pick up components like grippers and suction cup and whatever. So it'll identify the tool. Um, <clears throat> and then the next thing is it sets up a production line. Um, in a, we, we all know, right? Having one person do different tasks is less efficient than having one person do the same task over and over again in a line. It just happens to be boring work, but machines don't mind. And so the, the system sets up a production line and, and, and then the, the, the each, sec, each part of the line has its own tool as defined by the software. And that's how we set it up to begin with. So our machine basically has like a hot swappable. You, you take the tool out, you pick the tool from the library, you put it in, um, has an electric connector and some QR codes, and then it knows it's the right tool and you can do the work. Um, so that's how we do it. We, we actually do have a single station machine as well, um, where you can put down all the parts into a quick area. You put in the first tool and then it'll tell you, okay, time to swap out the next tool. We're doing that manually today. We've got a, we, we think that, you know, the, the, the future is the machine setting itself up with its own tools, but we're building the machine from scratch and, you know, we're, we're doing it step by step. Gotcha. Yeah, you, you also kind of answered my second question, which was around, um, obviously, when you're doing things in a stationary way versus a production line, it, it you know, you optimize more for like prototyping because you have flexibility, but you don't optimize for time because it's not repeatable as much. Uh, and so, you know, in so far as the thing that you you showed on the screen was a in place assembly, I was going to ask about how you thought about the break even of when it would make sense to do that versus longer run production uh, when you could actually specialize on the on the production line. But you kind of touched on it in terms of saying you're swapping 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 between both of those. Yeah, <clears throat> um, I'll, I'll I'll go backwards a little bit. So if you look at this one, this over here is actually conveyor belt. I don't know if you can see my mouse moving, um, but the, um, <clears throat> the 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 tools between the station. You see the first one is a suction cup. The next one is screwdriver. In between them is a conveyor belt, and so that's how we move the. The, the part of the process. If the animation was longer, you'd actually see the move between them. Um, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank yeah. you. So sure. um, there you go. You, you can see that happening over there. Not, not a super easy task, by the way, because there's a whole bunch of alignments that, that need to happen automatically when you move from one station to the other. And at the end, um, you can just about see it in the corner over there. We have a drop down that drops the end conveyor belt and brings it right back up to the beginning. And so it's a, a repeatable loop. We probably have to align all the different tasks on like a single like you know turn of the clock. We'll have to just move everything along the conveyor belt once and make sure you're aligning like the tack time of each individual set of tasks. And that's probably a little bit of a pain to do because they're not they're probably not aligned at all. <laughs> you're, you're totally right, and that's actually so. So if I if I showed you our backend software, it does all those calculations. It knows the time for every tool. It knows the time for every task, and it, it sets up the line. Um, well, you know what? Maybe I can. Uh, no, I probably can't. It sets up the line to, to, to be the most efficient that it can. I don't know if you saw, but you also are able to chain lines together with other lines and lines together with manual stations um, because I'll get to flexible components, very hard for us to do. And so we're marking those as manual tasks. And so we also set up the line so that all the automation is done, then all the manual is done, then more automation. And, and the idea is that the, the line is configured to be the most efficient given what we've got. It's never going to be as efficient as a complete custom built purpose line, um, but we don't think it needs to be. Um, we, we think that if you can avoid all of those upfront overheads, if you're making millions of units, you're not going to use our system. But if you're making 10 or 1,000 or 10,000, you probably are going to use our system. Uh, Thanks. That sense? Okay. Um, and we've been through this one. I think we talked about all this, right? Standardizing components and CADs and, and all the rest of it. So, <clears throat> right, right, right. Um, so I was talking about the, the visual inspection, um, which is point number four. So in order to get a product built correctly, you wanna make sure that it's possible to inspect every stage of production while it's happening. And that means you need to somehow, during assembly, leave room for a camera to look at it or an eyeball to look at it. Um, 
again, not rocket science, but it's worth thinking about because if you create an assembly that means that it's impossible to see inside during production, you don't know that it's being done right. The, the last point is <clears throat> basically trying to avoid tight tolerances where possible. Some components have tight tolerances, there's nothing you can do about it because that's the functional nature. But in particular, so we're thinking about tolerance stacking. You can define a particular tolerance for a particular component. But if you have lots of components with tight tolerances and then a final assembly with tight tolerances, the standard deviations could go the wrong way. And so you could be stacking tight tolerances on top of each other um, and end up with a product that can't actually be made. And, and, and that's a particular analysis that needs to be done by itself. Um, today, we're doing it manually. We've got a, a roadmap to actually automate that process of, of tolerance stack analysis as well. Um, th this one, <clears throat> as much as possible, um, think about orientation that we spoke about before, but also symmetry. Um, so the first one is try to avoid multiple uh, orientations because it means the product needs to be picked up and repositioned. Um, and if that does need to happen, you want to think about how that's done. If it needs to be done by a person, that's slow and expensive. Um, if it can be done by a machine because it's a, a, an axis rotation like this or a rotation like this that can be done with, uh, with, a, with, with an automated tool, that's better than a rotation that can't be done by a machine. Um, again, our system will, will point these things out. Um, symmetrical parts are both easier to make. Um, they're also easier to handle and feed into a machine. Um, it means that you can just place them on a tray without worrying too much about the orientations. Um, and so if you can make a symmetrical part, you should make a symmetrical part. It saves you money and, and makes it easy to, 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 to automate the assembly. Um, <clears throat> the, the last part over here, the last one is flexible parts. And um, I'll be the first to admit that we don't have an incredibly good solution for this yet. Um, the way our system works is it loads up every component into CAD and then it, 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 it simulates them and it simulates them using physics. And the simulation of flexible uh, uh, parts in physics is very, very hard. It also turns out that it's really hard to manipulate flexible parts in the real world as well. Um, and so as much as possible, you want to try to avoid, you know, an incredible mess of cables because as of today, machines aren't very good at doing that. Um, and so trying to minimize the number of flexible parts and cables, um, there's other ways to do stuff like contactless connectors, like designing different kinds of circuitry. So there are other ways to do things. Um, I got my gardener outside. I hope I hope you guys don't just hear an immense buzz of my baby. No, it's pretty clear. Great. At least for me. Of course he shows it now. Okay, great. Um, so. I guess the, the, the summary over here, um, taking all of these together, is that the designing for automated assembly, it really is just a bunch of best practices, which if you apply, makes all kinds of assembly easier and better, even manual assembly, because it removes a lot of the ambiguity and removes a lot of the possibility of error. So that's the first thing. So it's worth doing. Um, <clears throat> it, it, it also means because you're forced to define a little bit more upfront, it just means you save a lot of effort down the line. And in particular, when you want to scale up, um, because you already have all the information you need and you haven't designed a product that now needs to be in part or in whole fully designed. And so this kind of uh, this kind of thinking upfront is probably worth it. It's not required when you're going to be building products by hand, which is why I think a lot of people don't do it. But if you do it, um, it makes things much, much easier down the line for a bunch of different reasons. Um, that's basically it. Um, <clears throat> I, I just put a couple of notes over here about us um, for if anyone that's interested. Um, so we're a new company. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's only about 15 of us and, and, and but, you know, all experts in the field. Um, we, we're particularly suitable for the complex multiple components um, uh, kind of products that we spoke about. Um, so not so much for, um, not, not so much for small plastic toys or something like that, but, but yes, for IoT devices and medical devices and, and aerospace subsystems and that kind of stuff. Um, and also not for the super, super high volume. Um, we, we think we're particularly suited to the tens, the tens of thousands of units. Um, we, we manufacture the components using a network uh, of manufacturers we built in the US and, and a few internationally as well. And, and we're signing our customers now for, 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 um, for, for our beta test. So if anyone's interested and has some specific requests, you know, there's my email address, write, write it in the time. Amazing. Thank you, Yo. Woo! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Virtual claps. <laughs> I'm I'm super excited about what you're doing, and I'm super impressed with how far you've come in such a. I'm super excited about what you guys are doing. I think it's awesome. Yeah, it's it's interesting that we're both kind of catering towards, uh, you know, the ten thousand k, uh, unit realm. You know, 
I see tons of awesome partnership opportunities and happy to, happy to meet you. Um, I had a question about just some of the examples of products that you might be excited about uh, either now or like near future um, that you can't really do well before this type of technology. Like, is it, are, are these products like more bespoke, you know, or is it more about making uh, products that you could manufacture basically like smaller batches, more accessible, you know, to uh, small businesses yeah. for the cost yeah. savings. I'll give you three quick examples of, of real customers we're dealing with now. Um, and and they're, they're all different, right? The, 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 the primary reason that, you know, they, they see the value of what we're doing. So the first one is a company that makes um, like residential solar and battery systems. Um, and they need to control it to charge up the battery when the sun's shining and, and do all these kind of intelligent decisions. And if you buy off the shelf smart meters and controllers and modems and whatever, you're spending a ton of money on and, and, and also engineering efforts to piece them together. If you design your own uh, uh, product, PCB with, with, with all, the, uh, um, <clears throat> all the required sort of current sensing chips and that kind of stuff on there, um, you dramatically reduce the cost and the complexity. But they don't need to make a hundred thousand they need well they need 10 or 50 now in order to do their pilots and then they need a couple of thousand at a time um and that's really hard right it's really hard to make more than a few by yourself but 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 not ten thousand or a hundred thousand with a you know with an offshore manufacturer um it's a lot of work and it's a lot of pieces that need to come together because you need the circuit board you need to make it you need the the enclosure you need to be able to assemble the quality test them it's a whole bunch of stuff when what they really want to be doing is, is selling solar panels um, and so being able to design and, and then just upload it and get us making it and they know that it works is a big deal. Um, but a, a totally different kind of example of a customer is, uh, let me think which is the best one. So let's say, so we're, we're now uh, <clears throat> working with a large white goods manufacturer that, that wants to make a new product. And, and, you know, they make like fridges and dishwashers and that kind of stuff. And they want to make something which is much smaller sort of consumer the products. And they don't want to make a million of them. They want to make couple of hundred and then a couple of thousand to test out. And their supply chain isn't built for it, right? The same, the same enormous factory that can make additional shit can't make consumer electronics. And, and, and that slows things down on, on their side when it comes to innovation, because they can't do it in-house. They can't do it using the existing suppliers. Um, and, and so how do they do it? It's not like a startup that you can just get on a plane and go to China and figure it out um, because there's processes and that kind of stuff. So that, that, that is really interesting for them. Um, <clears throat> I guess a, a, a third one is an aerospace company. Um, we're, we're looking at a couple of um, a couple of subsystems for them, and for them, a really really important thing is that their products are made in the U.S. and that their existing they're similar sort of problem. The existing supply chains can make missiles, but not necessarily a, a control panel that, that is completely new. It takes a really long time and it's super expensive. So being able to have this kind of automated in the U.S. solution to do it would really you know dramatically speeds up the way that they can do stuff. Um, I'll give you another example though. We're, we're, we're now working with a, with a company that has already made some products in a, in a, with a contract manufacturer in China. And because of everything that's happened over the last year, can't do it anymore. So they own, they, they, they own the designs, they know they can be made, they actually have products in, in, in the market today, um, but they can't make any more because the manufacturer is completely overwhelmed. They, they, they've lost interest in making this product for whatever reason. Um, and now finding a new manufacturer is really difficult. The fact that they can just get their files to us, make sure that, that, that you know, it fits their requirements and just start making new products at a relatively cost comparative way to, to what they were doing, um, su super attractive for them. Yeah, that, that's amazing. So that puts them more in the driver's seat and they can kind of ramp up and down manufacturing more as needed. And if they're US based, they already have access to the I, I think more and more people care about it. The, the, you know, everybody cares about the cost of their products. And the, the good thing about working with the cheapest offshore manufacturers, you have the cheapest cost. But the downside is things can go wrong as well, and, and then you suddenly stop. So, you know, it's nice to have some alternatives. Yeah, I bet your iteration cycles can go way down and become so like much I'm shorter. Really, I'm really excited for the first customer to turn around the product. Uh, a new product dramatically faster and then iterate on that product in a way that's just never been done before. We, we haven't seen it yet. Maybe someone's listening today that wants to be the case study. Yeah, that's so cool. Maybe. 
Um, we have a question from John Foster. It says, in regards to standardized components, do you have a list of what that can be supplied by you to help? Maybe this is stacking on what another builder has brought in to make, which makes it cheaper. Designing inside the box has some advantages. It's a, it's a, it's a really good point. So the way that we operate at the moment is we're not keeping stock, we're not keeping inventories and that kind of stuff. And, and so we're using the same um, digital vendors that you could use um, and we're integrating directly with them. Um, sometimes with better pricing, but <clears throat> the, the sort of the, the, again, I'm sorry if you can hear that. Um, that it's okay. Microphone, can, <laughs> can you guys still hear me? Oh, the mower? Oh, yeah. Eh, it's okay. <laughs> we have I think Zoom, Zoom's doing a good job of filtering it out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good. Well, I Go tried to now. move the microphone close to me and I disconnected it at the same time because of my overzealous cable management. So <laughs> what, 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 um, what I was trying to say is that <clears throat> we're, we're, we're sourcing from, from standard vendors now. And so we're not really yet at a place where we're sharing components with different, uh, with different projects, but it's definitely on our, on our roadmap. Um, we we do um, we we provide like guides on the I wouldn't say the best vendors but the standard vendors to use um, and 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 so you know we're, we're happy to supply those to, to to find those kind of components to just make it easier than finding a super niche component that that uh, that you know is either wise hard to source. One thing that we do and and this is fairly early um, is we're doing some automatic classifications of components in a CAD file, uh, just using the geometries and comparing it to catalogs um, from these digital vendors. And so if you, for, for example, if you have a SKU that doesn't have the metadata for the vendor and the part number, our system will match it to the closest SKU that it can find in their catalog. Um, so again, early days, um, but we think that's gonna be, you know, the, the start of making it easier to be able to do this stuff. So you don't have to work quite as hard to, to make these kind of standardizations happen. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think so, John, unless you have any follow-up. We just had a question from Vassil saying, can I try your simulation environment and build something simple right now? Uh, yeah, sure. So okay, <laughs> shoot, shoot me an email. We're, we're all in private beats and stuff, but shoot me an email. I'll, I'll, I'll show you how to load it up and, and you can see it. Um, you can just see it operational. Um, uh, you know what, um, since, since, since you know, I'm screen sharing and stuff, and it's quite easy. Um, if you guys go to tryme.launchpad.build, um, <clears throat> you can sort of see what it looks like. It doesn't let you upload, but we've preloaded it with a few products. And so basically, you know, th this electronic door lock over here, um, if you if you look at the this, th this is the output of the simulation. So this is kind of what I'm talking about that happens automatically. The sequence and behind the scenes, the tools that are used and all the rest of it, that, that's, that's what happens automatically. So feel free, play around with it, shoot me some notes. We, we put this out a couple of weeks ago just to get give people a taster. Yeah, that's amazing. Do you foresee the that tool? I'm kind of curious about your product roadmap. Do you? I mean, obviously, you'd want it in the editor, like in the CAD tool as you're designing. You get that manufacturability feedback. You know, kind of like SolidWorks. If you're designing something that's injection molded, you get draft angle feedback. You know, as you're designing. Do you foresee your company like building a design tool or, or not? <clears throat> we, we talk about it a lot. I, ideally, what we do is we build plugins for the tools because you know the, the amount of effort that's gone into building those tools is really, really immense. Yeah. Um, so plugins rather than recreating the tools, probably the right way to do. It's not so easy. And, and because there's multiple tools, it means we're developing the same system over and over again and then bug fixing all the different platforms. So mm -hmm. we, we decided, you know what, we'll start with a website that's also less friction you don't need to download anything you don't need to worry too much about it you can just sign up and upload and, and see what happens but that's definitely the direction we'd love to go into um especially if there's a lot of demand from people to, to to go there yeah that makes sense it's a huge challenge um i was going to ask you about oh can we see the video of the machine working in the real world you mentioned that earlier uh, yeah yeah oh, if you sweet. Guys um let's uh <clears throat> look, look at me looking for a Mac. Um, uh, I have it on my desktop somewhere, I'm pretty sure. Uh, wow, your monitor is huge. Yeah, so 
um, and it's not the only one. So, so this is the part that you saw already. So this is the simulation and, and the rendering of the simulation environment. So this is the prototype um, that we have um, built. It's actually in Tel Aviv. And so this is the same product using the same components. This is a single station machine actually. So you can see, you know, you can load up the same components over and over, or you can load up multiple components. Um, you can actually see over here, one of the things we did to, we, we, we did the calculation, a lot of times we'll be using two tools next to each other. And so we built each tool can actually have two tools. So in this case, it's a, it's a, it's a suction and, and a screwdriver um, and, and following the same uh, um, things that are worked in a simulation. This one is actually a glue dispenser and then a, a housing. This was a real customer that we delivered um, in Israel, um, uh, basically gluing a lens onto a housing. Um, there, was a, there was a manual task that they were doing before. And so you can see you've got the glue dispenser over there and then it goes in and picks it up and, and, and puts it down. And in each case, like the only thing you need to do to set this up is load up the CAD file into the simulation. Um, it tells you which components to put down and what tool to put in. You swap it in, you swap it out. Um, and then it takes care of the rest of it, but how many units you want to do. Wow, how cool is that? I have a yeah. question about that. I, is there like a custom jig you have to make? It seems like it, right? To hold the, the thing in place, it's like a 3 deep in a custom jig. Is that also an automated part of the process? Or is that something great, you guys do great, manually? Great question, great question. Actually, so I'll, I'll bring it up so that you can see exactly. So in the simulation, you see these red things? So these are movable uh, uh, fixtures um, that the simulation tells you where to put, um, and then you put them down. So, so that's how we're approaching it now. That's not the, the end goal over here. Um, the end goal is to make it completely automated um, <clears throat> with, with a movable uh, fixture that does itself. We're not there yet. Um, you know, we're, we're doing this step by step, but that's like the, that, that doesn't solve everything, frankly, right? There's still some geometries that you can't fix this way, and you need to have either you know, a custom jig made in machine or 3D printed or whatever. So we haven't, we haven't solved every problem in the world over there. Um, gotcha. and yeah, that, that's the nice thing is the system can tell us, right? It'll tell us this particular orientation won't work. And so you need to design something. And then a human being needs to step in. What, one, one of the things that we've really sort of thought about is if the only thing we can do is work with 100% automation, we're really going to be limited. And so we designed a system to figure out what can be automated and also what can't be automated for a human being to look at. Hmm. Um, gotcha. Thanks. Can, can I ask? Uh, uh, I uh, I know uh, why you uh, make this um, uh, fixed uh, elements uh, because I work with uh, a CNC machine uh, about five years, and I understand how it's important to fix uh, the uh, material that you work on. But um, I have. Um, uh, think about combining uh, the uh, 3D printer to uh, uh, mix make this fixing uh, tools mm -hmm. uh, before you uh, you providing and also we can uh, we can use you can use uh, the 3D printer to make enclosure um, uh, produce it without uh, uh, fixing uh, elements. So when you are uh, starting the uh, uh, printing the uh, enclosure, then you, then, then you put uh, some components in, inside and finish the printed enclosure up to this component and sealing uh, the whole uh, product. Inside. So you, you, these are both really good points. There's a third place, by the way, for, for 3D printers, which is the trays that hold the components, that's another place. So as well as fixing the components so that they move during the assembly, you also can print, let, let's say you have a, a geometry of a, of a component that really doesn't lend itself to balancing correctly with gravity. You can 3D print a tray where all the components can be dropped into and that way they can be fed into the machine and, and, and assembly assembled. So that's a third place. Um, so so Alfred, um, our CTO, he was um, VP um, at Flex, the, the contract manufacturer with two responsibilities. One was um, automation, global automation, and the other one was additive manufacturing. So he, he, he very much thinks about this stuff. Um, <clears throat> and, and you're right, we're, we're thinking about those things for, for, for all of the above. Um, one of the, even the enclosure, by the way, one of the, the cool thing is that, you know, when you load up a component, when you load up a product and it breaks down the components, the system will guess that you want this made with a 3D printer because of the volume. And then you can click and change from 3D printing to injection molding, or you can pick a different material with a different kind of 3D printer. Um, and the prices get updated automatically for you. 
Um, and so, you know, we, we think about 3D printing a lot where, where, where it's useful. Um, <clears throat> the, the thing is like the movable fixture or, or the self configuring fixture, if you can do that instead of 3D printing every time, it's, it's faster. Um, and and so, so that's why we're doing it that way. Thank you. Any other questions? This is your chance. You know, I'd be curious, and, and you know, we previously talked about this a little bit, Joff, but you know, and you know, I came late, maybe this has also been covered already today. Um, but you know, I, I understand you guys do like, uh, of course, assembly, right? I think you also guys also do packaging of the assembled product, right? Um, what's the current state with like, you know, of the like injection molding, PCB printing assembly, what of that do you do in house today, and then what of that uh, is out? Uh, yeah, is done by third parties. <clears throat> so the the short answer is everything we're outsourcing today. Um, but our view to the future is that I, I guess it's two things. One is some of the technology we're developing could help with some of those things, and where it does, we, we can apply it. Um, and two is for the sake of speed and cost, we'll be bringing some of those things in house as well. Um, we, we have an idea of how much we'll be doing in-house versus outsourcing. We, we, we think that, um, you know, both are really, really important. Um, and, and the, like the thing the system needs to be able to do is component by component, task by task, figure out where it's going to be cheapest, fastest, most efficient, and route it to the, to the correct place, whether it's us or somebody else. Um, the, the, the most important thing is that we have those, you know, digital connections with all of our suppliers. Otherwise, it's always going to be more expensive to work with them. Gotcha. And so that, but that means that essentially you take over the whole project and then you sub, you organize subcontractors to do the injection molding, whatever it may, and then take, take care of the logistics of having it all arrive at your facility in time to be assembled and then shipped. Right, right. And, and gotcha. some of it is also to do with the, with the entire product. So if we can speed up, you know, if there's a 50 components in the product and, and we can speed up, you know, three of them by doing in-house, but there's, but there's still a long lead time somewhere else, we haven't actually saved any time in, in, in the cycle time in the entire product. So that also comes into it. Gotcha, thanks. Any other questions? If not, then I think we can wrap up unless there's anything else you wanna cover. <clears throat> I, I, I really thank you so much for, for the chance to talk to everybody and uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Really, really, nice to, really, really nice to meet everyone and, and you know, really, really, really great series you have over here. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks for speaking. Hopefully we can do it again. I know you got some other awesome talk topics to discuss. Um, okay, so I think we can close up. Um, the last announcement that I will give is that we are hiring for many different positions. So if you're interested in building tools to make awesome hardware and solve a lot of these similar challenges with us, you know, small batch manufacturing, collaboration and whatnot, um, hit us up. We're looking for designers, engineers, um, all across the board. I can put a link and uh, follow up. Um, but cool, I think that's it for today. I'm gonna take this recording, uh, put it on YouTube, I'll follow up. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. I think you have Yov's uh, email as well, in case anybody wants to get in touch, right? Or maybe you can put that in chat, uh, Yov. Uh, yeah, good idea. I'll, uh, I'll do it right now. Cool. Yeah. Also from my side, thank you, Joe, for taking the time today. This was really great. And thanks everybody else for joining today. Yep. Thank, thank you. you so much. It's been very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a good weekend, everyone. Yep. Take it easy. Bye. Have a good weekend. Bye.